society. I can expect, I can expect the world not to want to listen to the scriptures, but the thing that pains me, the thing that bothers me most of all, is that Christians and the church as a whole has deliberately, seems to me, or by default, rejected whole parts of the scriptures and doesn't want to hear it anymore because it finds it threatening, but the paradox is, instead of it being threatening, it's enriching. That's the same problem. And that's grieved me in my ministry more than anything else. Not, I expect the world to hate me and to switch off. But I don't expect Christians when I start, I expect Christians to switch off when John Klein expresses his ideas. I expect that. I'd hope that. But if I speak the word of God, what I'd hope for is that Christians not only listen, but welcome it. Feed on it. Feast on it. Love it. But that's not my experience. You, you, made, you made a great illustration there. John Klein, yeah. who speaks on a secular, secular way, yeah. but John Klein, who speaks prophetically, like we all... In office, in our, as, as Christians, as, Christians mm. as the mouthpiece of Christ. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on. Historical background to Isaiah. Now, uh, Isaiah falls into three parts, um, and the book of Isaiah focuses on the three crises in the history of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. What are the three crises? The first crisis is um, Jerusalem during the Assyrian period, covering Isaiah chapter 1 through to 39. The call of Isaiah comes in 742. Um, now, uh, let me give you a bit of the political background very quickly here. From 742 to 701, the Assyrians threatened everybody in the ancient world you may remember I've told you that originally the big superpower, the most ancient superpower, was Egypt and um, uh, Babylon. And they always jostled with each other, but they, in most cases, their interests didn't overlap. The Babylonians over here, Egyptians here. They both had their big rivers, though, you know? Those big river civilizations, and they had all they needed yeah. politically. Okay? But then. Um, uh, uh, the Assyrians from up here, beginning about 900, expanded. Their capital city is Nineveh, up here, northern Iraq, this area here. They expanded, not only conquering the north, but they pushed down to the south here. And as if that wasn't enough, they established the first big world empire. They, took, they then went up here and they came down and threatened uh, the countries here. Syria up in the north, Israel here, and Judah, and even Egypt down the south. Now, uh, uh, what happened in 730 or thereabouts uh, was that the northern kingdom, north of Jerusalem here, the kingdom of Israel formed an alliance with Syria up here to oppose the expansion of the Babylonians down here. And they wanted the kingdom of Judah to join with them in an anti-Assyrian alliance. Now, under the influence of Isaiah, God said, no, no, no. And as a result of that then, um, the Syrians and the Israelites in the north combined and tried to force the Jewish king down the south, the king of David, to join the alliance. They weren't successful. And because of the anti-Syrian alliance, instead of them um, uh, defending, being able to defend themselves, the Assyrians got hopping mad and they came and they first of all wiped out the kingdom of Syria and then they wiped out the northern kingdom and in 721 they destroyed the northern kingdom as a political entity. And all the ruling classes were taken, uh, deported, and put at the other end of the Assyrian Empire. 
The Assyrians were butchers. If I had time, I'd tell you terrible stuff about them. They are your original um, uh, terrorists. They, they specialized in the rule of terror. Now, um, that's 721, they destroyed the north, and then from there onwards they put increasing pressure on Judah and Jerusalem. And this came to a head in 701 when they had captured the whole of the kingdom of Judah, and all that was left was the city of Jerusalem. And you can read the annal of the Assyrian king who boasts that he'd caged up Hezekiah in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. The city looked as if it was about to fall. During all this time, uh, there were people around the king who said, look, get into alliance with the Egyptians. Call on the Egyptians. The Egyptians will come and save us. What Jeremiah and what Isaiah says, don't go into any alliance. Rely on who? God, God and he will save you. People thought he was stupid, as they always do when you preach the word of God. Rely on God, God will save you. 701... The city was about to fall, and then overnight, one, one, that one day, it looked as if the city was going to fall, and the next day, the Assyrians had disappeared. There was nobody there anymore. There were some corpses there, but uh, they, they disappeared. There's two things that happened. There was a plague, an epidemic that swept through their army, and there was also rumours, and correct rumours, of a rebellion back home in Nineveh, so the king had to get back as quickly as possible to put down the rebellion. And Jerusalem miraculously was delivered. <laughs> so God judged Jerusalem. He chopped the kingdom down to the stump. What was the stump? Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem. Under Hezekiah. And then out of that came a new beginning for Jerusalem and the kingdom. 701. Um, and Hezekiah was faithful, but then his son Manasseh, remember that terrible man, um, stuffed it up after him. That was the first crisis. The second crisis came um, about a hundred uh, uh, years later. Um, uh, I, I can't outline the complicated politics. You know, this is superpower stuff. Everybody's jostling for everybody, and poor Judah, Jerusalem, is in the center of all the plays. Uh, Egypt, the power in Egypt revived, they become stronger, and the Babylonians revived, and uh, uh, they eventually wiped out the Assyrians. And they wiped out the Assyrians because everybody hated them because of what, the way they ruled uh, with terror. Uh, so the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians, and they established this... Babylonian Empire. Can you see the Babylonian Empire goes from present-day Turkey all the way here into Persia um, and then reaches down and eventually they reach down into Egypt itself. A huge empire, the Babylonian Empire. And in due course they put pressure on Judah, Jerusalem. In six, uh, seven, uh, 597 they captured the city of Jerusalem for the first time um, and uh, uh, they deported as hostages some members of the ruling classes and there were two very important people that were deported at that, that, that time groups of people, there was Daniel and his friends yeah. right? they were deported 597 and so was Ezekiel, one of the prophets we're going to hear a lot about um, uh, they came then and they put their puppet on the throne. That silly man broke his oath, which he'd made in the name of God, and when the time was right and he thought he had Egyptian support, he rebelled against the Babylonians. And guess what the Babylonians did? Destroyed him. They said, oh, we're going to teach this blighter a lesson. And they came down with all their might, and they did, just didn't capture the city. Do you know what they did? They sat burnt it to the ground, including the temple. And they carted off all the temple treasures and they carted off all the citizens of Jerusalem, not all the people in the land, but the citizens of Jerusalem, into exile in Babylon. <coughs> yes? Besides the fact that it's, you know, the religious centre for um, all Israel and stuff like that, 
Was there any other significance for the Babylonians to take it besides like the religious significance for to take it? It had it had religious significance, it had political significance because it was the capital city. Uh, yeah. But it also had it was the great military stronghold of all sites in present day Israel the most easily defensible, strongest place is the city of Jerusalem. It's a natural fortress. Um, a fortress city. And so, yes, it's very significant. And it's been that like that for, already before the Jews lived there. It goes right back to ancient history. It's one of those natural uh, fortresses. Okay, the people went into exile in 586. Now, I'll cut a long story short. Um, eventually, um, uh, 537, the um, Persians out here, present-day Iraq, um, gradually expanded. Iran. I Iran, say, not Iraq. Iran, Persia, Iran. Um, Persian king Cyrus, D uh, Darius, uh, uh, you probably know something of them, gradually uh, uh, became more and more powerful and they took Babylon in 539 539 in a most remarkable way, it's one of those amazing events in world history the Babylonian, um, I mean the Persian army came and besieged Babylon but instead of bringing siege works trying to knock down the walls and storm the city they did something very clever pack lunches well, it was almost like a sandwich. Okay. It's not quite the Trojan horse, but it's even better than the Trojan horse. They noticed that uh, there were canals bringing water from the river to the city. They blocked them up. Over and overnight, the troops went down those canals. The people woke up in the middle uh, next morning, and guess what? Armies right in the middle of the city. There's the Persian army in the middle of the city. Not a single <laughs> shot was fired. And the whole Babylonian Empire fell like that. It's a bit like the collapse of the Soviet Empire uh, uh, just a little while ago, overnight. And the Persian king then established an empire that stretched all the way from India through to Greece. Until it was eventually altered. By the Greeks. OK, that's the big picture. Now, the third crisis that involves Jerusalem is when the people who were in exile in Babylon came back. And they came back beginning at 537, 520 um, to 515. They rebuilt the temple. And guess what they expected would happen once the temple was rebuilt? 515. What? God would come back? God would come back? What do you mean? Think in terms of the way they'd see it. They've lost a king, they've lost political power. They would get it all back. They'd get it all back. They would get a king, and this king would establish Jerusalem as the capital city, and he would do what? He, he would conquer the world. Do you know what happened politically? Zilch, zilch, zilch. No king. From 586 onwards, there was no king in Israel. There was no king in Jerusalem. The temple was rebuilt. They got back some of the land. They lost their political independence, and they didn't have a king from then onwards. Um, and that's the third crisis. How come God, after they had been in Babylon, after they'd repented and God had brought them back, how come... Uh, God didn't send them a king again who would establish then a world empire. That's the third crisis. Now can you, can you see there's those three big crises in the history of Jerusalem and the prophecies of Isaiah, the three parts of Isaiah focus on these three periods of history. Um, Okay, I've summarised that. Now, there was somebody had a hand up. Question. Well, I had a hand up. Before, of course, okay. Yes, Dylan. Yes. We spoke briefly 
one touched on briefly before, many lessons ago, about how the Romans put Herod in charge. Like yes. He wasn't a real king. Yes. In the sense of the Davidic line or whatnot. Yes. Were there any other false kings between these periods? Well, there were. Um, there was the Maccabean revolt um, against the uh, Seleucids. That's the the, yeah. the Greek rulers. But Judas Maccabeus, who led the revolt, was a son of a priest, okay. and his brothers. Um, so Simon Maccabeus, Judas Maccabeus, great figures militarily, geniuses, fantastic story. Um, I think um, the fellow who did the Messiah, what's his name? Um, the film, the, uh, the Passion of Christ. Oh, you um, yeah, Noel Gibson wants to make a film on uh, the Maccabean brothers, the Maccabean revolt, um, which he could do very well. It's, it's a fantastic story. They uh, drove out the Persians and established an independent unit, but they could not be crowned as kings, even though some people wanted to crown them kings. Why? Because they were priests. They weren't of the family of David. And some of, the, uh, some of them married into, later on, married into David's family to try and get some sort of David credentials. Likewise, Herod, who was only part Jew, who's basically Edomite, married uh, into the royal family to try and get messianic credentials, but that didn't wash. Were these Maccabees the same ones who wouldn't fight on, on the Sabbath? Yes. Yes. So they got... They're priests. They... Ah, they... Oh, so they, they came out of the priesthood. So they, they, yes. that's why they got slaughtered for... Uh, yep. Daughters. Yep. That was both their strength and their weakness. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't fight on the Sabbath. Yeah. They wouldn't uh, fight on the Sabbath. So the, 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 the... At least initially, but then they were slaughtered and then the, there was a decision made that um, the command to rest on the Sabbath, if it came, you, you couldn't engage in def, uh, aggressive warfare, offensive warfare, but you could defend yourself on the Sabbath. Um, Wouldn't that be kind of like common knowledge? People banging me with a sword, I might defend myself somewhere on the line. <laughs> okay. Now, the range of Isaiah's prophecies. Okay, can I go on? Yeah. Yeah. There's three parts of Isaiah dealing with the three big crises in the history of the uh, city of Jerusalem. Now, uh, the first one occurred in the life of Isaiah. The second two occurred 100 years and 150 years after Isaiah. Now, can you see the problem? Isaiah's not alive. Isaiah's not alive. Um, now, just bear that in mind, I hope. Yes. Now, the range of Isaiah's prophecies, they go from 741, 42, when Isaiah was called to be a prophet, to about 500 BC, when the temple had been rebuilt and um, restored. Okay, now, um, because this refers to events, and even names King Cyrus as the one who defeat the Babylonians and set them free from captivity, because um, of this range, Modern scholars who don't believe in prophecy and don't believe in predictive prophecy um, hold that there are three or two or three authors. So they talk about uh, proto-Isaiah who wrote, roughly speaking, Isaiah 1 through to 39. More importantly, you get scholars referring to Deutero-Isaiah, which is Isaiah 40 through to 55. And then they speak about Trito Isaiah going from 56 to 66. And the main argument here is that uh, uh, the prophecies from this part uh, don't seem to be referring to future events, but they seem to be referring to events in the present time, referring to uh, the fall of Babylon and the rise of King Cyrus and his encouraging the Jewish people to go back home to Jerusalem. Yes, Dylan? Didn't you talk about that though, I mean, in the way that the Hebrew language is structured? Yep. Yeah, so for these people it's not knowing. No, but it's, it's because, <laughs> because if you had... I don't want to believe it. It's, it's, it's the fact that, that instead of just saying a king coming from the east or something like that, Cyrus is actually Same. named. Yeah. Named, okay. Um, 
this. So um, uh, that's the theory of three Isaiahs. Like all theories, and with, which have to do with history, you can get some arguments for it, you get arguments against it. You can neither prove it nor disprove it historically. Um, the more I look at it, the less I'm persuaded by it. However, um, there is one part of it which uh, rings true to me. So I don't believe that there are three Isaiahs, um, although many people do. And there's no reason why you can't believe it, historically speaking. But um, what seems to be the case is that the prophecies of Isaiah were only partially collected when Isaiah was alive. And we can see, for example, reading very closely, there is one book that he arranges, one set of prophecies that he deliberately had copied to be handed to the future. Um, the prophecies of Isaiah, this is an oral culture, so how is, it, how is material handed on? Word. Word of mouth. So you have the disciples of Isaiah, the followers of Isaiah, who hand on, memorize and hand on the prophecies of Isaiah. Now, this is very easy to do because in Hebrew, Isaiah uh, speaks in the most beautiful Hebrew poetry, or not the most beautiful, it's the second most beautiful Hebrew poetry in the Bible. The best is in the Song of Songs. That is just... It's some of the greatest poetry ever written, Song of Songs. It's worth learning Hebrew just to uh, be able to read the Song of Songs. Uh, can I just finish this and then I'll have it. Uh, it's, it seems quite likely that the followers of Isaiah compiled the prophecies well after his death. And it could have been compiled as late as, say, 500 BC. Because when do you think people would have been most interested in the prophecies of Isaiah? When they came true. When they came true, and partly true, but then there were so many that still had to come true. Um, the period that you get beginning of intense interest in Isaiah, and it doesn't stop all the way to the coming of Jesus, is from 500 onwards. Um, and it's quite likely then that uh, uh, Isaiah was compiled or edited round about this time. And there's another thing that I'd like to make you aware of, and I think I could, you know, if we had time, and if you knew enough Hebrew, I could show it to you. And it's not just Isaiah. You get the text of a book is not just handed down, but sometimes you get in what scholars call glosses and interpreted glosses. Um, that that is, you get something like that, and then later on, to help the reader, you get an interpreted gloss, that is something. Um, you'll get a case in point of that, if I could just illustrate, in Isaiah chapter 7. Um, this is the prophecy of uh, the virgin giving birth to a son, calling the name Emmanuel. I don't know whose turn it is to read. Chelsea, is it you? Could you go to Isaiah 7, um, verses 16 through to 17, and see if you can work what, um, pick up what is, could be regarded as an interpretive gloss. The land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day of Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Right, uh, what's the interpretive gloss there, Josie? Josie? The last phrase. That day, just read that last sentence. Just read it again. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. Okay, that's probably where the prophecy ended. And then what's added there is what's this referring to? The coming of the king of Assyria and his invasion of the land. Um, don't scrub it out. It's just a, a help. No, an, a, a little interpretive gloss. Now, originally, these glosses 
if you can think in terms of, I'll give you a bit of manuscript theory, you get a page of manuscript like that. Hebrew, as you know, writes from the left to the right, like that. You don't have any, you don't have any vowels. You're right. Now, there were two things. Uh, then after they'd written a page, the, the scribe would count the letters per line to make sure that he hadn't left anything out. And if he'd left something out, and if it was only a little thing, then you would have a gloss here in the column. So you have two kinds of glosses. You have a gloss of something that's left out, Say in, you, you, you don't put it sort of a bracket there the way we do and put it up here. That's impossible because it's all very, there's not enough space. But there's space here for little markers. So if something's left out, you have some way of indicating this. And scholars have shown this you know, by examining manuscripts. The other one, that's very rare because if it's a private copy, then you don't destroy the page. But if, it's, if, if, if it was going to be used in worship, if there's one jot or tittle that's wrong here, do you know what would happen to the whole page? It'll be expunged. More commonly than that was an interpretive gloss. So the king of Assyria would be not here in the text, but it would be in the gloss. And then from the gloss it gets back into the text. That'd be like a footnote. It's like a footnote. Yes, it has exactly the same kind of function as footnotes in modern usage. Okay, now, more generally, so are there three Isaiahs? Well, we know there's three parts to Isaiah, and they deal with three different, focus on three different uh, crises. The focus of the book is on the place of Jerusalem in God's plans for the whole world. So even, the folk, even though the uh, subject matter is very narrow, the city of Jerusalem, the vision is huge because it's the place of this city in God's plans for the world. Ult the, uh, ultimately, these prophecies would be fulfilled um, and uh, be carried out at the end of the age, the day of the Lord, and the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. Take note of Isaiah 63 to 66 because that indicates when these prophecies would be ultimately fulfilled. Any questions on that? Now let's go. Yes, we can have still time. I want to look at the three parts of Isaiah separately because they, even though there's a lot of overlap between them, each has its own focus. And I'm going to spend some time with this book because it's one of the most important books of the Old Testament and it's also one of the most difficult books for modern people to make sense of. And for us as Christians, next to the book of Psalms, it's the most important book of the Old Testament. So in our three-year lectionary of readings, you get more readings from Isaiah than any other book of the Old Testament. Let's look at Isaiah 1 to 39. This falls into six parts. It's a bit complicated, and one of the problems is that everything seems to be thrown together, and it's hard to get the rhyme and reason of one prophecy following another. So you need to have the big collections. Uh, from 1 to 6, we get uh, the account of God's remedy of Israel's sickness, her refusal to repent, as well as God's um, uh, purpose for Zion in the future. You get very clearly God's vision for Jerusalem as a place of worship. Then in chapter 7 and 12, the focus is on God's use of Assyria as his axe. Remember the picture of a tree? Well, the axe in the hand of God that chops down the tree is the king of Assyria. God uses the king of Assyria to judge the northern kingdom. And um, uh, that's the one hand. The focus also is on God's guarantee that he would save the southern kingdom and the city of Jerusalem, the time of Hezekiah. 
And then chapters 13 through to 27, you get big picture stuff again. God uses Assyria to judge not just the northern kingdom, but many other kingdoms. And paradoxically, God uses the evil Assyrians to promote his purpose for Jerusalem and the temple there and the people of God. Then chapters 28 to 33, the focus is on the people of Jerusalem and the God's warning that anybody who resists his policy, his plan, his strategy for them would court disaster, would fall into trouble, would come under judgment. Um, but anybody who hoped in God and trusted in God and repented would be saved in the future, in the day of judgment. Then you get a stark contrast in chapters 34 and 35 between God's uh, judgment of the nations and the nations are, uh, have as their uh, sort of a typical nation is Edom. Now I don't know whether you know that Edom is spelled, if you don't point it, is spelled exactly the same as Adam. Adam. Adam so Edom represents Adam. Not Adam before the fall, but fallen Adam is Edom. So Adam is that pointing. Um, Edom is this pointing. Same consonants. So there's a contrast between um, God's instruction to the nations about the judgment on Edom as a type of his judgment on every godless nation on the one hand and his glorification of, of uh, Zion. Now notice the next part, it's very strange. We get some historical data from 2 Kings that's inserted here and the material deals with God's deliverance of Jerusalem from the Assyrians at the time of Hezekiah and the announcement of the forthcoming exile in Babylon. Let's have a look at the first prophecy, which is one of the most important prophecies, God's purpose for Zion as a place for international worship. Now let's get the, um, uh, have a look, close look at this, Dylan. Chapter 2, 1 to 4. Yep, you've got it. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important this is. This is the seminal vision. All the other visions of Isaiah amplify this fundamental key foundational vision. So chapter 2, 1 through to 4. Take it bit by bit. First of all, verse 1. This is what Isaiah, son of Amon, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Right, so it's a vision of Judah and, more importantly, the place of Jerusalem in Judah. Now, what's this vision about? Just read the title. In the last days. Just stop there. So, the last days indicates when? It's not this period. It's not this period, but it is this period. The last days are this in-between time. At the end of this age, the end of human history. So it's a vision, not for the present, but it's a vision for the future, the ultimate future. Now, what's going to happen in the last days? In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Okay, just know there. Now, what's the basic picture there? Put it in visual terms. Dylan? Um, well, with God's temple, I suppose that's sort of God's divine right as a God type of thing, and he's, he's obviously above all the others, and you, above everybody else. You are explaining the concept. I want the picture. Uh, what's the picture? Now, and this is the so problem. What I want is the picture. Get used to getting the picture first of all before you yeah. interpret it. What's the picture? Now, you've got, to, you've got to envisage the city of Jerusalem. The highest place in Jerusalem, you have the temple. Ah. The city. But what's funny about that? 
Jerusalem is surrounded, it's on a mountain, Mount Zion, but it's surrounded by higher mountains and hills. So Mount of Olives, Mount Scopus, all the mountains around Jerusalem are higher than Jerusalem. And uh, even Mount of Olives is not the highest mountain in the land of Israel, let alone in the Middle East, let alone in the world. Now what's going to happen in the last days? This mountain, the Temple Mountain, is going to be higher than all other mountains. So what's the picture? God will level other mountains and leave only one mountain, which is the Temple Mountain. Now mountains, people in the ancient world, the picture is mountains are places where heaven and earth meet. So in the last days, there'll be one mountain. We'll just get the picture. First of all, you've got to get the picture. And all the nations will come where? Not just the Jews. All nations will stream to it. Will stream to it. The picture here is of a river. Which is funny because rivers run away from now. Aha! You're getting the picture now. Interpreting it. Now, why is it that people in Judah would come to Mount Zion? At the time of Isaiah? To worship. To worship. They'd come in pilgrimage three times a year to meet with God at the temple. Now you get a picture, all other mountains are leveled. There's one mountain and not just Jews but all the nations of the world would flow uphill onto the mountain. Now all other mountains being leveled, what does that, what's that a picture of? Okay, all other places of worship will be removed. Okay, now, what will happen there? Keep going, Dylan. The next verse, verse 3. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. Just stop there. So, people from all over the world, not just Jews, but Gentiles as well, will come in pilgrimage to Jerusalem so that they can learn what? the ways of the Lord. Now what are the ways of the Lord, according to the Old Testament, are that he's merciful, gracious, forgiving. So they will learn what we would call the gospel. They would get to know God and the grace of God, the blessings of God, so that in turn they can follow God. They can walk in his way. So if God forgives, they'll learn to forgive. If God is generous, they will be generous. If God is merciful, they will be merciful. Do you get it? So that they can walk in God's ways. The picture, God leads them and they follow God. The picture here is what happens in worship. Now, how come people from all over the world will come to worship God together with the Jews in, on this mountain? Can you go on, Dylan? The Lord will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Just stop there. The law in the sense of the teaching. God's teaching will go out from Jerusalem, the word will go out from Jerusalem, and people will come in. So the message of God, the word of God goes out to the nations, and the result of that is the nations all come to worship God together with his people. Do you know which book of the New Testament is the fulfillment of that prophecy? Both acts. You've got it. What is it the ends of the world. You remember that? That's quite deliberately based on this prophecy. Yes? We talked about right, way back in the, very, the, the pantry about how mountains were like a meeting place between people and God. Yes. And how it was more of a pagan thing. Why would then God talk about his temple being built up on a mountain? Well, the, that then well what God's doing is taking imagery, pictures that are common in the ancient world and he's turning it on the head because the focus is not so much on the fact that he will raise this as higher than all mountains but what's he going to do to all the other mountains so this is the only mountain he, and you find that there's this levelling of the mountains, the chopping down of all other trees, so this is the only mountain and the paradox is that God comes down here um, onto this mountain. Um, now, just read the last part of it. What would be the result of Jews and Gentiles worshipping together in one place? Worshipping the living God. He will 
will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. What will be the result of people from all nations worshipping together is that God will, he will establish peace. He will settle disputes and he will establish peace. Not the way peace is usually established on earth, which is by the edge of the sword or by the law, which threatens the sword. So here you get peace that comes as a result of what? Worship. United. Worship. United. And listening to the word of God in worship. Learning the way of God in worship. So this obviously hasn't happened yet. Absolutely not. It's, <laughs> but it's happening. We have people from all nations here in this room, which is unnatural. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds. What's the only thing we have in common? Our common worship of God. Uh, you know, most dramatically, I, my ancestors come from present-day Poland, Eastern Europe. Where do yours come from? Korea. Korea. Mongolia, Mongolia, yeah, you can see it. You can see the Mongolia there in the face. Yes. Yeah, and yet we are together here. What is it that unites us? We worship the same God. Um, where do your ancestors come from? Do you know? Oh. England, is it? So, yeah, England. one of them. <laughs> yep. Okay, Garth, where do yours come from? Um places all over the world that's it you're, you're united nations yeah. right now now notice here that in the political vision the, the messiah would uh, wage war against the nations who'd be the enemies of God and force them to submit to God by the edge of the sword and he'd rule by the edge of the sword he would disarm the nations but he'd disarm the nations with the sword. Now what happens then? You get a funny kind of disarmament. Because people worship together, God adjudicates, settles quarrels, establishes peace, therefore what won't be necessary anymore? The sword won't be necessary. And nations then will turn their swords, which were made out of iron, into plowshares. Why? Because they don't need swords anymore. They won't need uh, to learn how to wage a war anymore because God will establish peace. Now, can you see how remarkable this vision is? This is God's plan through worship to establish his rule over the world liturgically, not politically. Not by the edge of the sword, but through his word, the word of the gospel. Yes? Then saying that the world is going to become more peaceful? Is it saying that? It says this is the last the days. The the this is the vision of what God has in ultimately in store here. Um, and this is what's being worked out here. Um, Not all the nations have yet come yet, but they are. this is being fulfilled at the present time. It's being fulfilled here and now. Can you see? Now, the irony is that the last verse that we read is the motto of the United Nations. What's the irony of that? The, yes, well, the United Nations, it's a political... They use this to try and establish world peace politically rather than spiritually. Not by the worship of one God, but by the establishing of a political world system, the United Nations. Um, Isaiah 2 verse 4, can you read it again so you just get it? This is the motto of the United Nations, the latter part of it. You want me to read it? Yep. Two to four. Okay. Um, no, just verse, chapter 2 verse 4. Verse four. Yeah, he shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many people. Now they've leave that out because the he here is God and they don't want anything to do with God, but they want the next. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up Against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's the motto of the United Nations. Take it out of context. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and if anything that's happened, uh, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's 
diminish some conflicts, but the irony is that United Nations, which was established to, to put an end to war, has done nothing to end war since it was established. Uh, now, this... Make sure you get your imagination... Dylan, please. Make sure you get a clear picture of what this vision involves, because this is the key vision. All the rest of Isaiah explicates this key vision.